Well, good morning. It is good to see you in the house of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord this morning from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim, proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. The first priority we should have as we gather together here on, during our Sunday morning worship is to magnify the Lord, to come together in intercessory prayer for each other and to sing praises and to worship our creator. God is bigger than our problems and joys. He's greater than our sorrows and successes and more significant than our tests and our triumphs. Let's praise God this morning. Praise the God that never changes. Praise the God that is worthy of our worship. Would you stand and, joining, and join me in singing hymn 657. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Sing with me this morning. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. getting here with the time change uh, in the early service. I think we were all here, uh, though the clock said one time, our body was saying another, and, uh, but we managed to get through and worship well this morning, but, uh, but I just want to commend you for remembering to set your clocks properly, and you are right on time for worship, uh, unless you thought you were getting here for Sunday school and now realize that... <laughs> You're here for worship, but we're glad you're here uh, no matter what, and uh, we just pray that today the Lord will bless you. I want to especially say welcome uh, to those who are uh, visiting with us or uh, guests or uh, it's been a while. We're glad you're here, and just pray the Lord's blessing on you and uh, that our time of celebrating the Lord Jesus Christ uh, will encourage you uh, in your journey with him, and so we're going to worship and praise him together. We do want to pause at this time to spend some time praying uh, for one another and praying for some special needs. I want to bring to your attention uh, some very pressing matters that I hope you'll put on your personal prayer time. Uh, we've been asked to pray this morning for LaShonda Olds. Uh, LaShonda is back in the hospital and uh, just needs specific special prayer and let's lift her up today. Also, let's remember uh, Jerry Stafford, who is in the ICU at UK Medical. Uh, let's remember him today. And then Bob Osborne uh, will be having a surgical procedure tomorrow uh, at UK. So pray for him uh, during this time. And then an update, we were praying for Morgan Chandler. Um, uh, pray for their family, uh, Morgan uh, went to be with the Lord uh, yesterday, so let's pray for them uh, at the church body today. And then remember Mark Rukavina. Uh, he will be going back to the doctor this week. 
and uh, very special uh, needs that exist there. So let's pray for him and Sherry and uh, his family, Richard and Vicki, and uh, keep them lifted up. Uh, David Marlowe is home, hopes to be home for a few weeks. Uh, if you incline to go check on him or visit, you might want to call beforehand just due to some of the medical matters. Uh, but let's remember him. And continue to pray for little Walker Mann. Uh, Brandy sent me a text Wednesday night right before our uh, prayer time and, and very concerning uh, request that uh, the little boy was having some issues as far as his stomach and uh, they were thinking uh, diagnosed with uh, NEC, which is a very aggressive type of infection. Uh, I know we, we, along with several others, went before the throne and asked the Lord to intervene. And uh, the next day as they went back to do x-rays and blood work, and uh, they went from uh, knowing the day before that all of the symptoms, all the x-rays and work showed he had it. The next day, absolutely nothing. And uh, doctors sort of flabbergasted about how can this little baby go from definitively having all of this and now it's, it's not there. And so we just thank the Lord. And let's continue to pray for this little boy. Uh, he'll keep growing. And uh, he's going to be a great trophy of God's grace. And uh, just a reminder of the life uh, in the womb, uh, his Bible. And it's sacred. And so let's pray for him. Pray for his parents. Can't, I can't imagine uh, you know, what they go through, having to leave that little fellow there. And traveling here and there and hadn't been able to bring him home yet so we just need to pray God to give them the grace they need over these next uh, couple of months so let's do that we've got important things to take before the Lord and let's together do that right now would you join me Heavenly Father we don't just approach this time flippantly and Lord we don't want it just to become a ritual just another part of the service that we check off, Lord, we realize this is our lifeblood, our lifeline. This is where this is where we draw from you, Lord, and and we awaken ourselves and humble ourselves before you to say, God, we can't go without you. We 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 are so needy right now. And Lord, we come alongside these families that are are facing very difficult matters in their lives and we pray that you will surround them with grace and assurances and love and they would just feel the the comforting presence of you lord father we pray for lashonda today that you'll bless this lady as she has battled in her physical body and pray you would intervene on her behalf this morning we lift up jerry to you that you'll bless him as he is uh, facing some very serious matters right now. Lord, we pray for Bob. We ask God that you would guide and direct the doctors in the surgery they will be doing tomorrow. Uh, be with Bob and Linda and encourage their family today. We pray for the Morgan Chandler family that they would experience the wonderful grace that comes to those who walk down and through the valley of the shadow of death bless them today and then father be with mark we pray as he goes in for uh, updates and as they determine exactly the type of procedure now with the surgery bless him and sherry and their families encourage them today and then father we pray for david we pray that the biopsy they took this week will give them clarity and direction in his serious condition and then for Walker, our prayer is this little boy would keep growing, protect his tiny body from infections and any type of health matter. We pray that he'll keep growing and that this little man, this little boy will grow up to be a trophy of, the, of your grace, a statesman and a spokesman uh, for the sanctity of life as he has proven uh, that that which is in the womb is, is the living, uh, breathing uh, human being that was created by you, Lord. And so bless him, bless his family. Now, Father, we ask your blessings upon this congregation of, of, of folks. We pray that you'll give us ears to hear, 
Help us to worship you, Lord, and help us to, to have an ear to hear what Jesus is going to say to us through his word today. Bless this time. Bless our sister churches across this association as they, too, are preaching the word right now. Bless their services and bless those who are tuning in and watching through our, our internet. God, encourage those families and individuals as they listen in to the word today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand once again if you're able. And we're going to sing him 624. 624, since Jesus came into my heart. Hear the word of the Lord this morning during our scripture reading. 
from 1 Peter, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because, because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. May the Lord bless the reading of his word.
here's my heart. your Bibles this morning, I want you to join me by turning to Revelation chapter 3. Find your place at verse 14 this morning. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. You make me sick. When I think of you, I just want to vomit. When you come to my mind, it makes me nauseated. If I was to say those words to you personally, you'd probably want to smack me good. (laughs) If one of our kids said that to a student at school, they would most likely be disciplined in some form or fashion, if not expelled. But believe it or not, those very words came out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. As he was thinking about the church that we look at today, that's what he had to say about them. Jesus said, when I think of you, it makes me sick. When your name comes before me, I become nauseated. The church at Laodicea is a confusing church. The passage before us is a very confusing passage. I've read and and I've I've listened to those that I know are, are technically do have the title theologian. And I've read some on one side, and they say when you come to this passage, you're dealing with the church that is the unredeemed church. You're dealing with the church that is a church that had a profession, but they lack possession. This is a church, or better worded, it is a a place that was nothing more than a social club that professed they knew God, but they were far from Him. And then I read other guys that have just as much credentials as being what we would call a theologian, and they say, oh no, this is a genuine church. These are true Christians that Christ deals with. And when I listen to both sides, the very respected people And then I read the scriptures for myself. I go away confused. (laughs) Because as I look at the individuals who were at the church at Laodicea, sadly the characteristics that are described of them, you would say they're lost. (laughs) And they're needing to be saved. But then as you look at the things Christ is saying to them, and the way He speaks to them, you would say, no, They are saved, but they have drifted so far away. They have become lukewarm in their relationship with Jesus. All I can say is I've come to the conclusion to be a lukewarm Christian, you are in a very dangerous spot. It's a serious spot. If you're a lukewarm Christian, you you are so close in looking like a lost person that you need to make sure you're really saved and if you are really saved you need to see that you have drifted about as far as you can possibly go. When we come to Laodicea we realize that the city itself had some distinguishing things about it that Christ was drawing from as he confronts this church. The city of Laodicea was strategically located and due to that It was a very wealthy place. It was a very wealthy city. They were known for their banking industry. They were known for their wealth. Uh, History records that in AD 60, when an earthquake destroyed the city, that when when Nero uh, offered to rebuild the city, they said to him, we got it. (laughs) We don't need any governmental help. We're going to rebuild this place on our own. 
They were so wealthy that they turned down help and they were able to rebuild the city and uh, due to the riches of this particular place. Laodicea was also a place that was known for its special cloth or clothing. They drew from, extracted from uh, the deep, dark, black wool that they were known for in that region. And so they were known for not only their wealth, they were known for uh, their clothier institution or industry. And then on top of that, they were known for their eye ointment, their medication for the eyes. They were known for their eye salve. And it was there that many people would travel who would have problems with their sight or eye problems and they would, they would receive of this medication and ointment and would find great relief for their eyes. So they were known for that. That was the good things they were known for in the city. The city was also known for having the worst water system of any place that existed. Laodicea, as I read about it, reminds me of Greenville, Mississippi. Pastoring down in the Delta, Mississippi, we, our water was not the best, and uh, many nights when we would draw water and fill the tub up for our children to take a bath, the water looked like it was already dirty. You've been there, you've probably been in those areas where it just was so high in, in certain levels of, of, uh, of, of things that it, it just had a brown look about it. Well, Greenville, Mississippi not only had a brown look about its water, but when you went there, it also had a distinct smell. It smelled like rotten eggs. I mean, you ever taken a shower and the water smells like that? I mean, it's like, am I even getting clean? You know, am I going to smell this away after I bathe? And, and, and you sure didn't want to get it in your mouth because if it smells that bad, it has to be something wrong with it. And so it was known for its, the stench of the water and the looks of the water. Well, Laodicea had the same problem. Uh, though 40 miles away in the city of Hierapolis was known for its rich, hot springs where many would travel to uh, recreate and to and bathe in the hot tubs. And then about 40 miles in the opposite direction was the city of Colossa that was known for its deep, cold springs Laodicea was right in the middle, and it was known for its, its lukewarm water. Literally, when people would travel to Laodicea, it was the saying that once they took a drink, they automatically threw it up. Jesus draws from all of these things to speak to his church about her condition. And when he begins writing and to the church, he says this in verse 14. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The first thing is Jesus reminds them once again of the author of the letter, the counselor to the church. He reminds them that it is the Amen who is speaking to them. If you've ever been in a service where somebody said Amen, has anyone ever been in a service they said Amen? <laughs> I'm going to be doing a, a one morning revival service for one of our local churches. And I was thinking, I thought, you know what I'll do is I'm going to preach that morning, kick off the revival. I'll bring my amen section with me. Then I realized, I don't have an amen section. <laughs> you know, the old black preachers everywhere they would travel, they would bring what they called their amen section. And they would, he would set them over here in a certain area. And, and like one man said, when a church says amen, it's like saying, sick them to a bulldog. <laughs> Jesus is the amen. He says, I am the amen. That word means I, this is who I am. I am the all-powerful one that's speaking to you. But not only is he the amen, he says, I am the faithful and true witness. This means, this describes what he says is going to be accurate. He's all-knowing. Therefore, everything he says is factual and it's faithful. There's no rumors when Jesus speaks. You ever dealt with rumors? I had to deal with rumors Friday. I spent half a day dealing with rumors. You know, that is the worst thing you can deal with. I mean, it's just sickening. It's, it's awful, you know. To have to track it down, have to confront, have to ask questions, have to get to the root of it, and then you realize there's no factual basis to anything that's been said. Spent half a day trying to resolve and find truth about something that had been said. They were all rumors. 
Thank goodness Jesus said, I'm the faithful and true witness. There's no rumors. There's truth. All-knowing. He's the faithful one. He's the factual one. But then it says he is the beginning of the creation of God. It doesn't mean he's the, the first one who began. It means he is the originator of it all. He started it all. He was there. He's always been there. He says, I am the originator of creation, which shows what he has done. He's the almighty one. He is the forceful one. And he is coming to that church with a forceful word. He says to them in verse 15, I know your works. I know the truth that you are neither cold nor hot. You're neither like the cold, deep springs of Colossa. You're neither like the hot springs of Hierapolis. You're neither now cold or hot. To me, I know some say, well, that means Jesus was saying you're not hot, which means you're not saved and you're, you don't realize you're cold and that you're lost. That could be what it means, but I, I don't think it does. I think he is saying just as the hot springs had their benefit, and the cold springs had their life quench, uh, thirst quenching benefits. You're neither. You're, you're, you're not beneficial. You're, you're not uh, uh, being a blessing. He says, You're neither hot nor cold. And he said, I wish you were. I wish you were cold or hot. I wish you were, I, I wish you were uh, progressing. I wish you were profitable. I wish you were accomplishing my work and my will. But you're not. He said, verse 16, so then because you are lukewarm. Lukewarm. What is lukewarm? Any of you that drink coffee? I know we got people today, they, they like cold coffee. You know, I've got, I don't understand that. You know, I like my coffee hot. I mean, hot. But have you ever walked in a room, you forgot how long it's been sitting there, and you're a hot coffee drinker? You take a big gulp, and it's like lukewarm? It just, you know, it's like, oh, that is nasty. Some of you said coffee's nasty, period. I don't know why you drink the stuff to start with. It's just picture in your mind that, that something you've taken a drink and you were expecting one thing and it's something else and it's just, Ugh, you know. That's what Jesus is saying to the church. He says, you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. And here we go. I will vomit you out of my mouth. <laughs> well, that's not very sanctified. Jesus using terminologies such as vomit? <laughs> he says, you make me sick. You make me nauseated. What a sad place to be as a follower of Christ. And he look at me and say, Brad, you're making me sick. You make me nauseated by your profession and, and, and where you are. You're not uh, effective. You're, you're not uh, where I desire you to be. I wish you were either cold or hot, which means I, I wish you were uh, uh, having an influence for the glory of God. But you become tepid. You become lukewarm. And, and you're making me sick. As we look at this passage of Scripture, we recognize that the counselor who is true in his words is being very frank with this church body, and that's the way Jesus acts and works, folks. He doesn't go around and, and, and pamper us or pet us and say, oh, you know, it's okay, it'll be all right, you just do the best you can. Jesus is very straightforward. He confronts us clearly. He doesn't leave us hanging. Hanging. He doesn't leave us doubting. You know, like, oh, I really wish I, I knew what he meant or I really wish I knew what he was thinking. Oh, he lets us know what he's thinking. And he's saying lukewarmness is a very nauseating position to be in. He complains to them about some specific things. Number one, he says, you're lukewarm. That's the first complaint. When we think about lukewarm, we're thinking about that Christian who started out well, he was hot, or he was cold. He was beneficial to the kingdom. He was having an impact. He was, having, he was effective in his, in his walk with Jesus. And the reason he was effective is because he made it a priority to spend time with his Lord. Prayer was a priority. He loved the Word of God. He, he worked as though it all depended on himself, and he trusted as though it all depended on his God. But over time... He became negligent. He began to drift. He didn't have as much time as he used to to 
meet with God in prayer. He didn't have as much time to get into the Word of God and read it like he used to cherish. He didn't study it anymore like he once did. He began to rest on his laurels. He began to rest on his past achievements and his past moments with God. And any time he was given the opportunity to speak a word, it always went back many years because that was the last moments he really had with God that were really vital and living. That's a lukewarm Christian. That is an individual who will have to honestly admit, I don't really pray anymore. Yeah, when I lay down at night, I let the, that's my prayer time. But you go to sleep so quickly, you don't even remember that you talk to God when you wake up the next morning. I talk to God when I'm going down the road and I'm really talking to God about all the crazy drivers that are around me. I'm not really having talked with God. My prayer life is nothing more than the same list of, of requests and names and it's just, you know, my few and, and that's pretty much it. I don't really communicate and fellowship with the Lord in prayer. It's lost its, it's lost its emphasis in your life. And when it comes to the Bible... That used to be something you, you couldn't get enough of. You wanted to read it. You enjoyed reading the scriptures and they were alive and living and, and you would make time to read the word. It wasn't a have to and a duty. But now you don't even open the Bible up. The extent of a lukewarm Christian's life is what he gets when he sits under the Sunday school teacher. And he lets the Sunday school teacher just kind of give to him the food from his own experience and that's basically your devotional life for the week. Or you come to church and the preacher preaches a sermon and we want it to be a powerful sermon, an impactful sermon, and one that moves me. And oh, when I'm moved, I feel like I've been in the presence of God. And that's the extent of your journey of discipleship. That's what the preacher regurgitates to you. Your time of learning about the Lord, you read books about the Bible, but you don't really read the Bible. You read experience that others have had with God, and they move you, and, and, and they put in you a sense of warmness, but you don't have an experience with God. It's all secondhand. That's a lukewarm Christian. And Jesus said, these are the ones that make him nauseated. Not only does he complain they're lukewarm, but he also complains, I believe, that they had become self-sufficient because in verse, in verse uh, 17, he says this. He said, because you say, I am rich. I have become wealthy and I have need of nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He was drawing from their environment where they were a wealthy community. They were known for their banking industry. He was drawing from the, the fact that they were known for their, their wonderful uh, textile industry of the deep, dark, black wool that they would use to uh, produce clothes. And they were known for their, their eye medication. He said, you're known for all of these things and you've become self-sufficient and you're self-righteous and sadly you are self-deceived. He says, just as you think you are, are wealthy because of the money in the bank and because you think you are so wonderfully clothed upon because of the, the, the deep, dark, black wool of your community or you think that you can see so well because we have this wonderful medication on hand, he said, really, in my sight, you are bankrupt, you are naked, and you're blind. That's a lukewarm Christian. A lukewarm Christian is one that depends more on their own, own strength than they do the Lord. They walk in their own understanding rather than coming to God and say, Lord, I need the mind of Christ. They bank on and depend on the money they have in their, their savings account or their 401k plan, their retirement plan. They're depending more on uh, their spouse or their family or their friend or their work the business where they are than they do the Lord. That's a lukewarm Christian. And it's easy to become guilty of being a lukewarm Christian. The second law of thermo, thermodynamics says that an outside source of energy is always needing to be added or it ceases. We need to recognize that coming to Christ and yielding our life to Jesus is the starting point for the Christian. It's not the end. 
We need the continuous influx and influence and source of energy that comes from our time with God every day that the Holy Spirit infuses and empowers us when we have our time with God, when we make that a priority, when we come to the Word of God and it becomes our living meat and bread that feeds us and it empowers us and energizes us and helps us to walk in a manner that pleases Him. We need to recognize the danger of having a form of godliness, but we lack the power of having lip praise for our God, but honestly, our heart is far removed from our God. The dangers of becoming a church member in good standing, but not being in good standing with the one who died for us. That's a lukewarm Christian. And Jesus says to them, verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Verse 18 is where it gets complicated because what he is encouraging them to do sounds like it's what, what you would say to someone who is lost to do. He's saying, come to me and receive of that which is greater than anything that you possess. He says, buy from me gold refined in the fire. It doesn't mean that we go and purchase salvation from God, but it's the picture of come and obtain from me what I offer you. Gold that is real, blessings that are lasting, blessings that are eternal. And then he says and clothe yourself with white garments. This speaks of the righteousness of Christ that we are to be clothed in so that we are truly clothed in His sight. And then he says that our eyes might be anointed with His eye salve that opens our eyes and we see. You see, when you're lost, you're blind and you cannot see and you need Christ to come and open your eyes that you might see. If this is truly speaking of a Christian, it means that we can so drift from our God that we fail to remember who we are in Christ. We fail to remember that the thing that that God takes great joy in is our recognition of investing ourselves in the things that money cannot buy, that earthly eyes cannot see of enrapturing ourselves in the righteousness of Christ and walking in that particular power. That's what God values. Verse 19 reminds us that, yes, He is possibly speaking to those who were truly saved because He then says, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten, which means I discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. You see, God the Father disciplines those who are His and when we drift from Him and become lukewarm in our relationship with God, He disciplines. He disciplines. If you're a child of God and you you find the characteristics of a lukewarm life, I hope you find yourself with much discipline. Proverbs says the way of the transgressor is hard. If you find that life is still just sort of the same and there's no major change, there's no sense of conviction of, of your relationship with the Lord, there's no sense of guilt in your conscience that you have forsaken your God and that you've neglected your Lord, if you're not uncomfortable with where you are and you say, I know that I'm lukewarm, then you need to run to God the Father and say, save me. Because if you're a child of God, there's going to be a sense of the disciplining hand of God coming upon your spiritual back end. It will. I fear when I see a child of God, a person who's a professing Christian that seems to have all the marks of a Christian drift from their God, flee their faith, continue to drift in a direction of heading toward lukewarmness. They are in a dangerous place, a dangerous position because God is a parent who will discipline His own. So He says to them, be zealous, wake up, and then repent. And then he gives them this wonderful illustration and invitation that I think many times we've used in offering salvation to a lost person, but we need to keep it in its context. 
Because if this verse is in its context, then this is not so much Christ standing at the door of someone's life knocking. This is Jesus standing at the door of the church in Laodicea. And he says to them, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and I will fellowship with him and he with me. The tragedy of that verse is this, folks. The church was meeting just like we're meeting now. They were singing the same song. They were hearing the same message. They were uh, assuming that they were doing kingdom work and ministry work. And the whole time, Jesus is outside the door trying to get in. He's not there. They're going through the motions. And this is what ultimately pictures a lukewarm church and a lukewarm Christian. Going through the motions, having the facts, but becoming self-sufficient and self-righteous and self-deceived and forgetting that we desperately need the one who died for us every day. Here Christ is banging on the door, knocking, and said, if anyone hears, and oh, we need to ask God, Lord, help me to hear again. I have become so carnal in my walk with Christ. I have become so lukewarm that I don't even hear the voice of the Spirit anymore. I've become deaf. He said, if anyone hears and opens the door, I will come in. What a wonderful picture of mercy. If there was any church that should have had Ichabod written over the doorway, the glory has departed, and God said, I'm done with you. I wipe my hands of you. I have called and called, and you would not return to me, and I'm done. But here he is, mercifully, in his long-suffering nature, reaching out further and further to a church that was so undeserving. That shows the mercy of our God and the grace of our God. He said, if you open that door, I will come in and dine. I'll fellowship with you. How is your faith? How is your personal walk with the Lord? Do you find that that you are just drawing from past days of faithfulness? What, What you know as far as as God's will and word, does it go back to moments way back when when you were investing yourself for yourself, digging and studying the word of God? Does your prayer life go back many days, months, maybe years that you say, that's the last time I had a vital prayer life with God? Hear what the Spirit says to us. He is saying, we are lukewarm, if that's the case. He encourages us to return to Him and open that door and say, come in, Lord, and take over. Forgive me, Father, that I have neglected you and I've missed my time with you so many times that I don't even think about it anymore. It's not a priority in my life. My personal walk with Christ is is pretty much dead And I'm sorry, Lord, that I make you sick. Today, the church needs to examine. We need to examine as a whole. Are we self-sufficient? Are we self-righteous? Are we self-deceived? Are we truly relying on the Lord for everything that we do and attempt for His glory? Are we accomplishing it in the strength of our human flesh? Or are we doing it in the power of our God? It's, 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 it's okay and it, it's necessary that as the church that we stop and, and examine ourselves as a church. But then we go further, we examine ourselves individually. Today, would you do that? Would you take some time today and just say, God, as I look at my relationship with you, with, with you, Jesus, and I look at where I am and where I was, my prayer life isn't, isn't where it needs to be or where it used to be. I can't remember the last time I cracked the Bible open and just read it just to feast upon it. I've become cold and indifferent. I've become lukewarm in my life. 
and just go before the Lord and say, Father, I'm going to open that door now. Come in. Fellowship with me as you promised you would. He says to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. He gives us a clear explanation of the call and invitation. He exhorts us to to come and follow through with repentance, and he invites us to take him up on his offer. Christian, if this morning you say, I am a lukewarm Laodicean, there's hope for you. Take the step today. This may be the day that we just have an old-fashioned altar call where we come and just say, Oh, God, forgive me. I have become lukewarm, and you're sick of it, and I'm sick of it too. Just come and get it settled. Come to Him. If you're here this morning, say, Brother Brad, I've never opened the door to personal faith in Christ. Then I want you to know that Jesus, though the context may be for the church, is also for you today. And He is knocking on your door. He's knocking on your life's door. And He wants to come in. Let Him come in and be Lord of your life. Yield your life to Him and turn the reins of your life over to Him. He'll do a better job with it than you will. Just say, I surrender all. I'm coming, Lord. I give my life to you. We want to give you that opportunity this morning. The Holy Spirit, as He speaks to you, respond to Him. Come. Come today. Come and be saved. Come and remove these clothes, the nasty, self-righteous clothes that Jesus looks on. He says they, they're filthy rags. Come to Jesus today and say, all oh, the things that I pride myself in my accomplishments, God looks at it and He said, it's just wood, hay, and stubble. Come to Jesus and say, oh my, what I think I see in life and I think I can see so clearly, I realize I am so blinded. Open my eyes, Lord, that I might really see you and see your wonders, majesty, that I love you deeply and more. I want you to come today. This is a time, individually, at the church, that we come. I want to close with these final little words here. This is an inscription on the cathedral in Lübeck, Germany. And here's what it says. You call me master and obey me not. You call me light and see me not. You call me the way and you walk me not. You call me life and yet you choose me not. You call me wise, and you follow me not. You call me fair, and you love me not. You call me rich, and you ask me not. You call me eternal, and seek me not. You call me noble, and you serve me not. You call me gracious, and you trust me not. You call me might, and you honor me not. You call me just, and fear me not if I condemn you blame me not today what will you do you know where you are you know what the Lord say you know what the Holy Spirit is saying be honest and then just come to Jesus today settle it. this invitation time is your opportunity just to come and Settle things with your Father in heaven who know the truth. He knows your works. He knows your heart. We invite you to come. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing our invitation. And as we sing, we invite the church, we invite individuals to come. As we sing Room at the Cross for you, you come. You come today. Say, God, I want to take off these filthy rags. I'm sick of my lukewarmness. Come today if you're lost and say today, I want to be saved. I'm thankful there's room at the cross that I can be saved today. Come right now. Don't be embarrassed. Humble yourself. and Come and get right with the God who saves you and loves you. You come. As we sing, you come.